Okay, um, good afternoon everybody. Um, I'm your host for this afternoon. Um, my name's uh, Adrian Willard, I'm the Project Director for BBC Research and Development based at Media City. I'm also on the advisory panel for Creative Exchange and uh, the non-exec board of Future Everything. So um, I'm really proud to be uh, hosting this session. Fantastic uh, how busy it is. This is last one of the day. Um, I've only heard fantastic things about what's been happening earlier. Um, so hopefully this will be as good as everything else and I'm sure it will be. Um, right, so for, this is a session called New Interfaces for Culture. Um, it's basically, um, We've got three speakers. I have to apologise in advance that um, for personal reasons and quite unforeseen, Bill Thompson from the BBC can't make it. Um, I'm delighted uh, Drew Hammond is going to step in and talk about digital public space and cover off some of the themes that uh, Bill was going to discuss. Um, we've also got um, Michelle Terran from Ubermatic and uh, Steve Crossan from the Google Cultural Institute. Um, what we're going to do is, uh, Drew's going to give a short presentation uh, about digital public space and about the Creative Exchange who are uh, facilitating and supporting this session. Uh, then we're going to ask Steve to uh, give a longer presentation discussing the Google, Google Cultural Institute. And then Michelle is going to take the stage. Each will talk for about 20, 25 minutes. And at the end, um, we're going to have a panel session. The only way I know panel sessions work is if people ask questions, because my questions aren't very good. So as you're listening, as you're taking in a lot of what they're talking, think of, you know, stimulating, let's have a debate, if necessary, let's have a fight at the end type questions. Otherwise, it'll be three short questions and we'll be off to the bar. Okay, first up, uh, I'm going to ask Drew Hammond uh, to join us on stage once he's finished texting or tweeting, uh, as is appropriate for a member. Um, Drew is in this guy's is going to be talking in his role as a researcher at Imagination. Uh, that's right. Thank, thank you, Adrian. So uh, I'm taking the place of uh, Bill Thompson. Bill Thompson sends his apologies. Uh, he's had some, some unavoidable family issues uh, and is going to make it up uh, tomorrow and make it up to us then. So I'm going to be mini Bill, uh, which are quite some large shoes to fill. Um, I'd first like to just follow up on Adrian's comment that this session is uh, presented in association with the Creative Exchange. Uh, the Creative Exchange is one of four knowledge exchange hubs uh, supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, um, uh, led by Lancaster University with the Royal College of Art, Newcastle University, and in association with Future Everything. So, um, digital public space, that's the background to this session. Uh, we've got two sessions in Future Everything exploring this concept. Uh, new interfaces for culture is this session, and then we've got one tomorrow, bringing archives to life. And then we've also got some other activities uh, in the summit. Um, there's a, a workshop tomorrow, a Europeana mashup, where you can get your hands dirty and actually start playing and creating uh, with some of the ideas we'll be talking about. And there's also uh, a project, Chatter, uh, which I, I introduced this morning and I'll say a little bit more about. But first, I just want to just back up and just give the background to these sessions. So the Digital Public Space is an initiative that's come out of BBC archives um, and has now <coughs> become much broader and brought in a whole range of partners. And in essence, it's about making culture freely available, about creating an open, accessible resource of culture. To do for culture, and what I mean by culture is you know, all of human recorded history uh, and heritage. Uh, so, you know, the contents of our broadcasters, of our galleries and our museums, making them accessible um, in formats that people can uh, access, use, create, rework, to really do for cultural assets what the open data movement has done for public information. Um, the, it started very much uh, as an internal BBC initiative, um, really facing the challenge of what they do with all that stuff. Um, but it's really caught a fire, and it's kind of connected uh, with other initiatives uh, outside. And people within the BBC, such as Tony Aggie and Bill Thompson, have been planting seeds and getting people like us, like Future Everything Involved, like the Creative Exchange, um, uh, and British Library, Tate, Arts Council, many, many different people involved in this. And it really parallels other initiatives. 
Um, it parallels the work that uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee is doing on open standards, uh, work around the open web. Um, so it's one of those initiatives which is really trying to advance the agenda of open culture and open technology. Now, a lot of that work is, is in the plumbing. It's in the, the, the frameworks, the, you know, the, the, the standards that, that really are the key, key enablers to this. This session is about the interfaces, how we can create interfaces. And one of the exciting things is that when this stuff, when it's, when it's available, it becomes an n-dimensional space. There's no limit to the number of interfaces you can build into this space. And, you know, the underlying work's going on, and what Creative Exchange and Future Everything are doing is we're bringing those experiments in interface. We're building and testing now those, those prototypes and those experiments that can help stretch our imagination uh, about what might be possible in this space. Um, as a little added extra, we also did a publication. Uh, I think this session, now I'm on the stage, can double as a book launch. So uh, we have a lovely publication which uh, many of the speakers uh, here have contributed to. Uh, so Steve Crossan and your cousins and, and Bill, uh, many people, um, and that's available on, on the Future Everything site. It was uh, uh, launched uh, uh, yesterday, I think, that'll appear in a second, and we've got some really incredible articles um, uh, in that. So uh, that, that's the first, oh, it's corrupted, there you go. Um, <laughs> it's the browser, it was doing it, there you go, by magic, they're all there. <laughs> Um, so that's like 17 short explorations of this idea, and we're really trying to, you know, this idea has been in the ether for some time, and on the one hand it's a narrow thing about how we can make cultural archives more accessible, on another hand it's really lit a torch to really think, let's have fundamentally rethink how we do culture, how we Im imagine heritage. If all of human recorded history becomes available at our fingertips, what new experiences can we imagine? So, the Creative Exchange, uh, led by Lancaster University, but with Royal College of Arts and fantastic people, Neville Brody, uh, guys up in Newcastle, are uh, developing uh, a number of prototype experiences and projects, have done some work really working through this concept, the idea. Future Everything's been involved, as I said, a wide range of, of uh, people have been involved. And in this session, we're going to hear, hear from, if you like, a parallel initiative with Google Cultural Institute, and then we're also going to hear from an artist who is experimenting in, in these concepts too, in Michelle. I'm just going to touch on um, some of the, the experiments and projects that I've been involved in, both with uh, Future Everything and with the Creative Exchange in uh, the last uh, year or so. So um, one of them, um, the Arts Council with the BBC, uh, ran a, a prototype service called The Space. Um, without wanting to be critical to any of my Arts Council colleagues in the space, in this room, um, I think that the, the real driving vision behind that wasn't communicated to everyone because certainly some of us viewed this as a prototype for the digital public space. It's about how we can create new online experiences out of an open resource of culture. So last year, uh, Blast Theory did uh, a project with us with Future Everything and we were looking at creating a, an urban game with uh, live video streaming uh, to basically experiment in a new form of you know, time-space experience, a new kind of interface. Now here, the archive wasn't um, uh, you know, historic cultural material. It was a live video feed, and it was the chat and interaction of people around it. You know? So we're really kind of pushing the idea of what the archive is as well. Um, there's a project going on now, um, which I mentioned earlier, which some of you will have experienced. And this is a Creative Exchange Future Everything project, uh, led by someone called Ben Dalton, with lots of other people involved. And this is, if you like, this is, uh, uh, it's chatter, and we're, we're recording your conversations and putting them online permanently. We're transcribing them, putting them online. You'll get the forms, you have to sign a form if you take part. And this is, you know, it's like, it's critical design, if you like. Um, so it's, it's asking deep questions about future technologies. So we're familiar with you know, Google Streetcar capturing incidental events. There was one a couple of weeks ago in Manchester. I don't know if anyone saw that. I'm not going to quote it or show pictures. Um, 
And, you know, these are our incidental, personal, very personal moments broadcast onto the web. So there's actually, there's other dimensions to the digital public space which aren't necessarily things to be celebrated. And so chatters probing and questioning some of those aspects. Um, another project uh, that I did was called Emoto. Um, Emoto was uh, a data visualization of London 2012. Um, and in this project, um, we were interested in creating a new interface to the Olympics as a, a global online event. So um, in looking at the Olympics today, in a sort of social media age, <coughs> Where is the public experience? You know, where do you go to find uh, the public interaction response around the games? Traditionally, in sporting events, it's in the stadia. You know, it's the roar of the crowd, or it's people in their living rooms, or in a pub. Where do you go today to find that experience? So we looked at social media, and um, we looked at the emotional response, and we focused on, on Twitter. There is no global space in social media, so we picked one platform and looked at that. <coughs> and through sentiment analysis, we looked at the, the emotional response. We analyzed millions of tweets in real time for, for topic and tone. And we visualized the, uh, the, the interaction throughout the games and then created a, a physical a data sculpture. We made all that data tangible in a physical interactive sculpture each of those bars representing one, the data record for one day of the Olympics. And then we did some data journalism, analyzed the data record, and projected some of the stories onto the artifacts. So you could query the artifacts and the peaks and troughs of the, the data record. Um, and one of the interesting findings from that, if I probably should wrap up, I'm almost on 10 minutes, um, is so, so this project, uh, as I say, it was an experiment in creating a new interface but it certainly wasn't on an open resource of culture. We were working with Twitter. And for us, that's legitimate because we're, we're building it as we go. We're creating these little prototypes that enable us to test different questions and, and aspects. But actually, it really highlighted the limits of the, the current social media space. So uh, Emoto was hit by a big sea change at, at Twitter. Twitter's going through lots of internal work, trying to work out what their business model is, and they're shifting towards pulling their tweets off third-party platforms so they can monitor and monetize, and we got really hit by that. So we had access to uh, a, a partner to the Firehose, which is a full uh, stream of, of, of tweets in real time, and two weeks out of launch, we were told due to a change in terms of service that we couldn't access that. So we had to build new infrastructure. And in a sense, it, we were pushing the limits of that kind of walled garden uh, model. And, you know, it could prove to be the last big Twitter visualization of its kind. It highlights, as with a the theme this morning of the API economy, that when you're building stuff on top of other platforms that are essentially private, they're only at best a SADO public space, the tap can be turned off at any minute. So it raised some interesting uh, issues, but also was a fantastic design experience. It was about creating a new way to experience, to interact with, with culture and with a sporting event. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay, so um, our next speaker is, um, I'm really pleased um, that we're going to hear more about um, from Steve. This is Steve Crossman. He's the head of Google's Cultural Institute based in Paris, which uh, launched just under two years ago. Um, prior to that, he helped found um, <coughs> Google's first ever R&D institute outside the States in Zurich. Um, he claimed, there's a claim in here that he was the product manager on Gmail, so most of us in the room are eminently thankful, um, particularly those who work behind corporate systems. Not when I tell you what I do. Okay, then we may think. Um, Steve's going to uh, spend 20-25 minutes taking us through uh, hopefully a stimulating uh, intro into the work that's going on at Google Cultural Institute. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Um, so, hello everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me, Drew. Um, and uh, thank you to all the amazing 
speakers that have been going on today, it's been quite something. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I'm going to quite, go quite fast, um, uh, because I'm basically just going to show you some stuff, show you some demos of some things. Um, but uh, that, the title of this session is about uh, interactivity and open uh, cultural data. Um, so I'm going to talk very specifically about that, about user interfaces to the data and some of the stuff that we've learned in the last two years. There's about 20 of us engineers in Paris who work on this stuff. We started two years ago. Um, we did a bunch of uh, experiments, a bunch of uh, pilot projects to begin with for about our first nine months. And for the, for the, since then, we've really been sort of learning on that and, and building out on that. And essentially, we're here to build a set of tools and a set of services for the cultural sector, fundamentally to get culture online, um, to help that ha happen. That's already happening in a lot of places, but also to help people engage with that material. Um, so I'm going to go straight into what we did. So we started off, this is one of our, of our early pilot projects. Um, uh, it was called the Google Art Project. The first thing, the first version of it was a partnership between 17 museums in nine different countries. Um, it's now expanded to about 150 or something museums in 42 different countries. Um, but this was the first thing we did. We, were, we sort of did a very kind of classic corporate social responsibility corporate type thing, which is we went out and did a bunch of partnerships with some museums. We brought some material online. We tried to make it look nice and we tried to, to do some interesting things with the technology. Um, so this is... Um, the Starry Night. Um, we, you know, we went through a process of creating some some very sort of ultra high resolution images of these things, so that you can actually kind of get right down and into the brush strokes of these things. It's quite nice if you come if you come right in, you can sort of start to see the the actual physicality of the paint there, which is sort of quite nice. Um, uh, but uh, this project was very much sort of focused around. In a lot of ways, this was focused around the technology, because that's what we know. We're, we're a technology company, we're not artists, we're not curators. Um, uh, so naturally, the first thing we thought of was, how, what can we do with technology? Let's throw some technology at the problem. And I think that's one of the themes that's really emerged over the last two years. It's definitely a theme of today and a theme of the conference, is that sort of the technology is not really the point. The technology is sort of going into the background. Um, uh, you know, people younger than me these days don't even talk about the internet because they take the internet for granted. All of this stuff is sort of there for granted. We've got all of these things, these, uh, you know, supercomputers in our pockets. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe the technology isn't, isn't necessarily the right thing. So the first, anyway, the first thing that we did was we just, you know, threw, threw some technology at the problem. And, uh, you know, we created, uh, I'll just go through to the, um, the good bit of this, which is later on. You know, we, we went around a bunch of museums, um, we had a process that took a bunch of uh, uh, high resolution images um, uh, of, the, of these paintings. We also went around with street view inside the museums with a trolley and we captured interior street view um, uh, of the museums and, and we created this project which sort of generated quite a lot of buzz and was quite interesting and in some ways pushing the boundaries of what it was that you could do with the content. Now, I'm not going to go into that too much. Um, let me switch back quickly to the Starry Night just to show you that, um, you know, indeed we went in, this was the result of some of that stuff, you know, we went inside the museums and, you know, you can, you can navigate around the museums and, and, and go and see some of these works as though you're actually there if you can't get there. Um, so uh, that was all kind of, oh, let me just show you, I'm going to take a very brief aside to show you something which launched just today. So this is hot off the presses, um, hasn't really been seen before, but I think this is quite interesting. We've now got about 150 partners in this. Um, and the, we, in fact, are about 180. We just launched an, another 30 today, including this um, excellent um, uh, set of uh, uh, Sao Paulo uh, street art, um, which I think is really nice. And I particularly think it's nice because one of the early things that we built was this tool, which is a comparison tool, which is this sort of very erudite, you know, um, curator, art historian in a museum looking at two different works by Van Gogh and like, noticing subtle differences. And I, I think it's really great to do this with, with a bit of street art. So. Um, uh, that kind of stuff allows you to do that, and then you can sort of go in and like examine the the, the, the details of these different artists and, and, and their techniques. So I think I think that that sort of stuff is quite nice. So that's sort of hot off the presses. Now, <coughs> what was what is interesting to me about this is that um, it's nice. There's there's a lot of there's now about forty thousand works of art in there. Um, uh, a lot of them are high resolution images. We now have a bit more context and a bit more story around them as well. Um, but it's still a little bit, if you don't know what you're looking for, if you're not a researcher, if, if you're just looking for a way into the material, it's still a little bit, you look at a page like this, it's not completely obvious where you should go. 
Um, uh, one of the other um, early projects we did was an archive project with um, the uh, Yad Vashem Museum in Jerusalem, um, which was around um, an archive of um, photos of, uh, from Eastern Europe between about 1935 and 1945, during the period of the Holocaust. Um, uh, a lot of photos of, uh, of, of villages in Eastern Europe and documentary records as well. Um, and we brought all this material online and, and made it available. And again, sort of a nice project. You get some nice headlines. Um, uh, people say nice things about Google in the press. Um, uh, but again, not very obvious about how you get into this. Um, but uh, one thing that was very interesting about this project was that the Yad Vashem Museum decided to allow open comments on the content. If you think about this, this is, a, this is a, 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 you know, the preeminent Holocaust museum in the world. And you know, allowing open contents on a, on a project by Google is a fairly, you know, it's a brave thing to do. Um, uh, they didn't even moderate the contents before they went, put the comments before they went live. They took the attitude: if anything bad happens, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll take material down. In fact, they didn't, um, uh, because the they they got you know tens of thousands of comments on the material, and uh, they were overwhelmingly interesting and adding value to the to the material. Um, and one of them was uh, on this uh, photo, which is a photo of a man called Yeshekel Fleischer. Um, and in the metadata which had come with this image, which was scanned by Yad Vashem, the only thing that was there was the, was the name and, and a place. Um, but amongst the comments, we got this comment, um, which I'm not going to read the entirety of, but I will summarize very quickly. Um, um, it's by somebody who, it's by the grandson of Yushekiel Fleischer, who'd seen this thing online, and he came in and made, the, made this comment um, about his grandfather, who was at, in the Red Prison um, in Lithuania. Uh, after two months, only 140 had survived. My grandfather told me that while he was in prison, he made a vow that if he survived, he would have myself photographed, so that the memory would never be obliterated. And this is the photograph that he took as soon as he came out of the prison. Um, and with the help of a fellow prisoner, um, he took the photograph after his release. He went to live in the ghetto and then escaped. He hid in the forests um, with his grandmother, who he'd married secretly in the ghetto. And they were eventually liberated by the Soviet army in 1944, after hiding out in the forest for three years. Um, at first, the Russian soldiers thought he, he was German and wanted to kill him. But he had stitched the photograph, this very photograph, into his coat. And he showed it to the, to the, to the German soldier, to the uh, advancing, the liberating uh, Soviet army. And uh, that saved his life. And he died in 2009 in Israel at the age of 91. So suddenly this material becomes much more interesting because there's a story there. And in this case, a pretty amazing story. So we thought, okay, this is, this is, this is something, this is, this is what we need to do. We need to somehow enable not just bringing the material online, but enable storytelling. And so with um, the Cultural Institute um, site that we have now, um, google.com slash cultural institute, it's, it's, uh, the, f the focus is very much on storytelling. And uh, we have, so we, we have, you know, the archive is there. I can show you this. So this is now sort of real live shiny stuff. Um, uh, the, the, you know, the material is all in there. I can search through the material as well. But the focus is on the storytelling. Um, and on, let me have a look just at these because this is the one that I wanted to show, um, are on these things which we have structured as, sort of as though they were you know, virtual digital <laughs> exhibitions. They're a mixture of commentary which has been added by the curators, the material itself, um, and in some cases video, um, in some cases this could be artwork. Um, really it could be any, any kind of material which is brought together in, in, uh, by, in some sort of curatorial process by somebody who knows what they're talking about um, uh, into... Uh, uh, a set of objects. Now, let me. I just wanted to show you this particular video here because I really like it. Um, we we see a completely non-racial society. We don't believe, for instance, in the so-called guarantees for minority rights, because guaranteeing minority rights implies the recognition of portions of the community on a race basis. We believe that in our country there shall be no minority, there shall be no majority, there shall just be people. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, you can go and look at the rest of that for yourself. It's really good. Um, and this, this is along with a lot of other really interesting material. This, we, this came from the Steve Biko personal archive, including the manifesto of the black consciousness movement here, which is a great document and uh, is, is, is very well worth seeing. So all of this stuff is now kind of much more engaging to users because it's available in stories. And in fact, this really worked 
we saw that the engagements per user, you know, session time per user, all that kind of stuff that we track went up about five times from the, from the archive version of this content to the story version of this content. Now, the important thing is that we didn't build this. We didn't build this exhibition. We didn't build this. We didn't curate this. This was done by curators. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build one now, because actually that's the great thing about this conference. It's not just about talking. It's about making stuff. Um, and so I'm going to make one. Um, so uh, here we go. So I'm, I'm now going to flip over to the, um, the part of the tool which faces the people who are making the exhibitions, who are making the, 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 the virtual collections, the virtual objects. And I'm, I'm going to, and I'm going to create one of these. Now, um, first thing I'm going to do um, is go and find some material. Um, and uh, I think, because of what I was thinking about earlier, uh, I'm going to um, do something on the Kinder Transport, um, which was... Kinder Transport, for those of you who don't know, was from about 1938 through about 1940. Um, something like 10,000 children were evacuated from uh, Germany and Eastern Europe um, to the UK um, uh, in an in a, uh, operation that was sponsored by the UK government. Um, controversial in some ways, but also um, uh, you know, lots of people, including lots of uh, people whose uh, video is here, were, were saved. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and collect some of this material. I want I want this one because I secretly know that it's good. Um, and a couple of personal items here. And, uh, and then some, some photographic material. There's one particularly good photo that I wanted, if I can find it. Um, yeah, let's, let's add that one. Go back um, and add a couple of more photos. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curating, to, I'm collecting together my material, and then I'm going to go back and just create my exhibit here. Um, here is I'm going to put in a date range because I know that it was about uh, March 1938 when it started. It was about May 1940 when it finished. Um, I'm going to use I think this as my background photo. Put that in there. I'm going to add a couple more panels here, um, put that one in there, and then another one there, um, and put in this object here, which is um, one of the dolls from a woman called Ingrid. So this is um, Ingrid, Ingrid's doll. Put that together. Um, push that down there. Save that, um, and then finally, I'm going to add in this great video here. Uh, actually, I was going to put the coat in there as well. That's a very interesting coat. So these are these so these are objects. So this this is actually interesting because this is mashing up stuff from different partners. This is from the Imperial War Museum and also from the Ad and There's some material from Time Life in there as well um, to create this 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 exhibition and. Actually, what I'm going to do with this video is I'm just going to go and edit it because, uh, oops, it's failing to load the video. Let's just see if my network connection is going to work here. Um, let's finish that editing for a second. Go back there, go across. Um, let's see if I can edit that. Great. So I happen to know that at about 28 minutes and 15 seconds, there's a good bit. Because this is an hour long. These are testimony videos from Yad Vashem, and they're sort of some of them are three, four hours long. So you don't necessarily want to put the whole thing in there. Um, 28 minutes, and that's close enough. There. And then I'm going to save that, uh, finish <coughs> editing, and then preview it. Um, so here is my, here is my. Um, exhibition on the Kinder Transport, which I've created. I put some material together and see if I got the right bit. And how was life to you in Manchester? It was very nice. It was a Jewish uh, community. We used to have, uh, uh, have uh, friends and we used to go 
also, they were also religious. We used to go Shabbat to Shul. And, uh, and this goes on as well. So this is a, this is a lady who was part of the Kinder Transport and who was eventually ended up um, being looked after by a family in Manchester. And she talks. In fact, quite a lot of the, the testimony on there is from families who ended up in Manchester and who uh, ended up um, part of the community here in in Manchester. And there's some very interesting stories there. So that's that's me very briefly showing that this is this is something which is you know supposed to be open to people who are who are non techies to to create these these more engaging experiences. Now. Um, uh, the, that's only sort of one step towards where we really want to get to. So far, all of the work that we've done has been with partners who've come and signed bits of paper with Google and you know curators from those people and, and some third-party curators as well. Um, but actually, we don't really want this stuff necessarily to be living on something called google.com slash cultural institute. What we really want to do is uh, more like what... Uh, the what we did with the uh, Nelson Mandela um, partnership with their site, which is essentially the same uh, the same set of um, technologies, the same tools, but um, actually served off of the NelsonMandela.org domain. I don't know if you can read that at the back, but that is generally the, the Nelson Mandela um, domain. Um, um, so this is the, 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 the you know the same sets of tools, but um, uh, you know constrained to uh, the uh, uh, the Mandela site and the Mandela material. And where we're going, and I hope to get here by about June of this year, is to actually open this up so that anybody can, can participate, anybody can use this set of tools um, with their data um, to create these sorts of experiences and to, to get them to users and to get them and to get users starting to share them. Um, I, again, I'd emphasize that this is only, what we're trying to do here is to do something which can have some scale because it's very easy for lots of people to use and it's very easy for lots of people to participate in it. It's not, I would say, the epitome of what you can do in terms of digital interactions with cultural objects. I think there's a long way to go there and we'll continue to invest in that and make that, make that better and better over time. What we've tried to do is to do something that is actually just open that a lot of people can use and which nonetheless creates something which is an engaging object um, and is interesting for people. Um, uh, there is, there's also a content management system side behind this which allows anybody who wants to play, excuse me, to upload the material. Um, there's a whole story which I don't have time to go into which is about cleaning up the metadata because that's one of the problems that we found is a lot of partners have it's extremely difficult for them to invest in, 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 in cleaning up their metadata, which makes things difficult to find. So we're using a bunch of technology to try and help people clean up their metadata, and there's some interesting wins around that. Um, but for reasons of time, I won't go into um, too much of that. Um, so that's, that's, that's one exploration, I suppose, of, what, of interfaces for culture in a digital world um, and in a world of uh, digital culture objects at scale. Um, and that's pretty much it. If you want to contact me, I'm stevie at google.com. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Okay, um, our third speaker is uh, Lady uh, Michelle Terran from Ubermatic, a Canadian-born artist whose work explores media performance and the urban environment. Um, she's currently a research fellow at the Bergen Academy of Arts and Design, Norway, um, and I'll let her introduce her talk. Um, can we have a big round of applause, please, for Michelle? So I'm just going to um, give a little brief introduction about what I'm about to do. So this is the artistic contribution to the panel, I guess. Um, so I've been asked to give an introduction um, to my body of work and how it outlines and opens up and questions uh, digital public space. Um, but rather than give an overview of a few projects, I thought I would just instead um, uh, introduce a few approaches and methods to my work, and then dive into one example that I hope will show my research with uh, personal archives, um, how they permeate an urban space, and then, then also looking at the tension between intimacy and, and being in public. Um, so, as an artist, I'm currently using online video as source material for mapping out cities to interrogate how a narrative language can emerge by revealing a field of relations between digital mapping, social media, and the urban landscape, um, and also different people living in the city. 
So these current works refer to an ongoing interest in the relation between media, connectivity, and perception in the city, which have involved uh, repurposing uh, the language of surveillance, uh, cartography, and also social networking uh, to construct various scenarios that call um, and make visible uh, conventional power and social relations. Um, so the following presentation is a restatement and of an actual tour that took place, and um, with no further explanation, I'm just going to jump into it. So today I'm going to take you on a short uh, city tour of Essen, Germany. Um, this tour is about bodies and cities, uh, invisible maps, and hidden, hidden performances. Um, so now we're going to begin. So the tour starts here. Let's get a little closer. Okay, we're currently standing in the middle of the Museum Folkfang. Um, the Museum Folkfang is one of Germany's best known <coughs> museums. On the satellite imagery beside, behind me, you can see that it's still an empty space, a blank spot on the map. But let's get a little closer. On Google Street View, however, we see a construction site filled with scaffolding, cranes, metal fences, and large square blocks of concrete that will soon become the spacious, light-filled, and pristine building that you stand in today. Perhaps one of more of you will ta have taken the bus that takes you free of charge straight from the train station to the museum entrance, like I did yesterday. Maybe you were one of the people waiting in the lineup which snaked all the way down to the sidewalk in order to buy tickets to see a regrouping of what was once one of the largest collections of modern art before the Nazis started to dismantle and spread it around the world in exchange for foreign currency. But today, we're not going to look at the major landmarks or pivotal events in history, but rather at the unofficial monuments and incidental moments of today. It is a regrouping of the many different temporalities and narratives within the same site that together forms a map of the city. It is a map <coughs> composed of people describing who they are and where they live through the videos that they have made and put online. When a person attaches geographical data to a video, a process also known as, as geotagging, it's easy for me to know exactly where these images were recorded. Somebody says, look at me, this is my body, in my city, this is where I am and this is what I do. One could say that these videos are part of an ongoing collective production of cultural memory formed by the accumulation of numerous personal archives now made public and accessible to many. We could be witnessing the beginnings of future guides for cities that describe a way of existing and inhabiting both city and network, which is told through the many performances, actions, and events that constitute everyday life. <coughs> or we could be witness to an entanglement of fictions but I digress, and I will leave it up to you to decide. So if we get out of Street View, now if we start to move slowly out of the museum and back into the street, we will eventually end up at the house of the maker of Ima Mensch, where we will encounter a philosophical video that attempts to describe why we always feel so empty and exhausted. Now, according to Yoke's spirit, the maker of the video, a person and the energy that one has is like a bucket that needs filling. If you fill yourself up with good energy, such as serenity, love, joy, then you will feel happy and fit. However, if you fill yourself up with things like angst, stress, and hate, this is when you begin to feel the energy being robbed from your life.
Your bucket can also start to get holes, which are consequences of an upbringing that has taught you how to internalize limit, limits. On the top of this, there are the dreaded vampire buckets that surround you and try and siphon off your energy. So the trick is to try and overcome anything that prevents you from attaining your maximum well-being. By finding ways to fix the holes, avoid the parasitic buckets, and fill your own bucket with nothing but positive energy. We should maybe think about these words as we move on to our next stop, a single dwelling home where R0M4AX, or Marco, is trying to win back his girlfriend, Sophia. The video here features a series of still images of Sophia that she took of herself using a mobile phone. Sophia is heavily made up and wears a series of tight t-shirts and low-riding jeans that show off a flat, toned, tanned midriff that she seems very proud of. She assumes a number of poses that mimic or emulate a type of sexualized femininity taken from popular culture. Inserting himself as scrolling text, Marco acknowledges, I did a lot of shit in our relationship, but that after the breakup, I only realized what I had really lost, namely you. And finally, you are the girl that I want to be together with. Across the street lives a 35-year-old woman who has lost her father, her father to lung cancer. He died almost two years ago from today. She tells him how painful it was to watch him suffer, that every minute without him is like a world without light. There is a photograph of her sitting on his lap as, as a small child. She leans against his chest while he drinks coffee. There is a picture of a hand clutching a teddy bear with the words, I miss you. There is an empty bench under a tree red poppies in a field, a father and his child walking hand in hand in the distance. She says, a memory is a window through which I can see you whenever I want. On the other side of the city, Fairfried is playing the blues. He sits in his living room near the camera and plays the guitar. There's a sofa in the background on which are placed two more guitars and a sleeping cat. The late afternoon sunlight streams through the window, hitting the floor. He looks to be about 50, slightly unshaven, and wears a striped shirt and baseball cap. When we finally enter his living room, some of you will be sitting on that very same sofa. Although the guitars are no longer there, and the cat has long since gone, adding to yet another death in the family, in the city. You will sit quite attentively in a row while he sits in a chair across from you. He will try and speak German with me, but in my nervousness I make so many mistakes that he reverts to English. Later on, when he starts to sing, his booming voice will take over the room while his wife stands smiling by the door entrance. 
If there's more music that you desire, we can always visit Mateus 1201, who is playing Ave Maria on his Yamaha PSR 7000 electronic organ. In the video, you will only see the, his hands as the camera has been placed on the right end of the instrument in a way that captures the entire keyboard. You can also see the flashing LEDs from the control display, a fragment of a doorway, and one of the walls in the room where he sits and plays. If you go to his YouTube channel, you will encounter 76 other videos of Mateus playing the organ in which he now mainly faces the camera. He uses very tight framing, showing only his face and the top part of his torso. Sometimes he'll wear a black button-down shirt, sometimes a white one, sometimes a cotton tank top. His speciality is Schlager, a type of popular music consisting of sweet, highly sentimental ballads with a simple, catchy melody or light pop tunes whose lyrics typically center on love, relationships, and feelings. Later on, when we finally meet him, he will find, you will find a serious young man in his 20s. He will be wearing a suit and sitting stiffly amongst a group of strangers around a large table. He will have come on the train from Hagen, having moved there the year before. We will learn that this was due to a very traumatic breakup that not only resulted in a change of place, but also of occupation. Currently, he works in, in a service for the Abelio Rail Company. This he regards as a bit comical, since he doesn't really like to be around people. While listening, I will silently try and recall all the, went, women, um, the men and women that I have seen wheeling the refreshments cart up and down the aisles of the various trains that I have taken throughout the country, trying to imagine what other layers are present behind these fleeting glimpses of unknown faces. I will be reminded that people, like cities, are fragmented and consisting of many lives, and many selves. After an expectant pause and lull in the conversation, he will take his place behind the Yamaha organ that he installed in the corner across the room and begin to play. I will experience a surge of emotion when I realize how fragile this moment is. Stepping out from what is familiar and known to him, he now stands in front of us, exposed and insecure. We are out of the frame and into the real world, where suddenly the noise of information and media is replaced by a simple encounter, which is actually very complex and layered. But where does information end and the material begin, or is it even that easy to separate between these two modes of existence? All the people sitting in the room will give him full attention and small smiles of encouragement, so as not to make him lose his nerve. I will contemplate that affect is social, a shared space created through an, an encounter. Later on, to please me, he will start to sing a song in English, but then falter on the lyrics and stop apologetically saying, I can't do this. Some of us will stand with Mateus and sing the song together with him. When we finish, I will smile and embrace him. Continuing our trek, we will find Mr. Red Baron 76 and his four-week-old puppy, Cleo. Nietzsche, 321's tarantula. Bolslim's fighting roasters. A group of men are celebrating Ramadan. Friends are having a grill party. Hannah sings alone in her living room. XXX, Mr. Bombastic, XXX stacks dice. <coughs> is Boeing walks up and down his backyard and shoots at inanimate objects with his bow and arrow. On April 3rd, 2010, Leon is spending his fifth birthday in the park with his parents, aunts, sister, and grandparents. He begins the day in the kitchen eating a bowl of cereal while his sister gets dressed. He will soon be getting a bike. Just past Danda Manstag, Maximilian is trying spaghetti for the first time.
He sits in his high chair while his mother feeds him, one noodle at a time. He tilts back his head like a baby bird while she drops the spaghetti down his throat. He reacts uncertainly but quick, quickly gets accustomed to the sensation and gestures for more. As she gives him the last piece of spaghetti, she playfully grabs the other end in her mouth and faces him. She laughs as he recoils in surprise. For our, last stop, <clears throat> for our last stop, we're going to head far away from the city centre and towards the south. There we will find Klatchi 70, a.k.a. Karsten, who is constructing his new house with his wife, Antje. <coughs> In the days and months that it takes to build a new home, they will show us the various stages of its development. Most of the time, Karsten holds the camera and provides the narration, but sometimes Antje takes over. One sunny morning, Antje films Karsten um, standing outside by the exterior wall, which is now nearly completed and requiring just a bit of paint. The portable toilet is still there for the construction workers, and the front lawn is still a mass of untended weeds. Inside, she shows us the floor heating, recently laid down. Achten. Innen soll die Fußbodenhaltung komplett verlegt werden und morgen fängt der Estrich an. Einmal Seitenansicht. Guck, da geht schon einer nach Hause. Einmal von vorn. So, wir sind hier im Wohnzimmer. Und schau, wir haben überall die Fußbodenhaltung verlegt. Außer in der Küche an der etwas falsch. Gehen wir mal in die Küche. Aktivität. So, oh, jetzt sind wir im Badezimmer. So, jetzt haben wir das Dachgeschoss. Meine Herren, ist gerade ganz schön warm hier. This is the video that we will use to find the actual house, but we'll only know that we have truly arrived when we see their name on the door. We will stand hesitantly on the welcome mat, deciding whether or not to ring the doorbell. When we finally do so, Anche will open the door and give us a puzzled stare. Although she's busy preparing for Karsten's 40th birthday party, we will convince her to give her a tour of the house. The rooms will appear much smaller than on the video because now they're filled with furniture. I will recognize two cats, one black and one white, that are sitting on opposite chairs. Karsten's teenage daughter will be there with her cousin who is visiting from out of town, and they will just be leaving to see a movie. 
In the backyard, we will see some tables and, large white, and a large white tent festooned with many colored balloons. Just as we are driving away, I will see Karsten pulling up in his car. We will quickly pull around and I will run back down the road so I can have a picture with him standing in front of the house. He'll laugh and tell me that if I check back later, I should be able to see the video from his party. And now we will as well. And this event, and this, and with this video ends the tour. Kriegen Sie den Kofferraum denn auf? Jetzt guck mal. Ja, dafür ist gedacht. Machst du einen Strich? Roving mics, uh, yeah, two, two volunteers with roving mics. Um, so if you can start thinking of some uh, provoke, thought-provoking questions, that would be really good. Um, thank you, speakers. Um, absolutely fascinating. Uh, in line with the the idea of interfaces to um, the digital public space, both offered sort of fundamentally different. Carsten and Nelson Mandela. I think that's the way the world's going to go. <laughs> Carsten, for the brief hour we've had, is as famous as Nelson. Um, I do wonder, as, we, as the digital public space in all its ambition becomes more and more realisable, how much the role of curation comes into it. I found that the, the story, Michelle, maybe if you would care to consider from your position as an artist, that it became so much more meaningful when you took control to guide us through that story. And then it made Steve reflect on the tools. Um. Yeah, but I think the notion of the curatorial is kind of a in essential um, today. Uh, and it just keeps, um, with so much information out there, it's about sort of pulling together things into sort of certain constellations. I think constellations is a better word than collections. It's like a certain constellation to map out a certain meaning by the relation between these different disparate objects. And so that's why uh, the person that is sort of making that arrangement plays a fundamental role in it. Yeah, and, th and therefore, me, maybe Steve, to expand, that, does it become even more important to consider the tools to allow curators? What, I, what, was, what struck me um, uh, uh, seeing the performance from Michelle there um, is that uh, the, the tools that you're using there, Google Earth and Google Earth Tours, um, you know, I know, I know the people who built that, and they, 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 they would love to see this, but that's not what they built it for. Um, but, and so in that sense, it's not sort of fit for purpose. But it's awesome because of the story, because of the voice, because of, it's, it, you know, the tool can be a little bit crappy for the purpose, and the result can still be incredible because the data is there and it's been curated and it's been put together with a, with, with, with a particular point of view and with a voice. And I think that is the lesson that I took there, which is that you don't actually have to make it beautiful. If the, if, the, if, the, if the data is there and if you can find it and if you can curate it and if you can put that together with a certain set of questions and a certain sort of interrogation about what all of this means, then you can, you can, you can create something amazing. So actually that to me, points to the fact that 
um, having the material available is primary. And the more, not just you know, artists, curators, historians, all of us can, can, can reach that material and can work with it, the more sort of interesting cultural objects are going to be created out yeah. of it. And, it, and yet, I, and maybe Drew, if you want to pick up on this, I, I found, I, if I'm really honest, I found it that slightly unsettling moment where I realised that someone could curate a complete fabrication of my life of what I've videos and, yeah. and don't I don't please intend anyone to do that. <laughs> However, the idea of the privacy, the idea of the, the the responsibility to respect the rights of the individuals within it seemingly we're still at quite an early stage of understanding how much we put out there. Um, maybe it's a generational thing. I, I, I welcome thoughts on that. But, Drew, you, you know, you've, you've been experimenting a wide range of data sources. You know, how do you feel? Is this a real issue or is it just a, a, an issue of this moment? Well, I think there are t two issues to pick up on. One is a kind of that issue of our, our own personal lives being material for artists to sculpt or curate. But then there's also this, this role of like, who's the curator, which I think is really interesting because um, just as like the remix has become almost like a general uh, metaphor for how we engage in media these days, um, I think you're seeing something similar with the curator. Um, I think we were talking about it in an earlier session um, as well, you know, and, and it's because we, we never come to something fresh, you never come to a blank sheet of paper. You know, everything's sculpting and reworking something. And actually, it's, it's sometimes really hard to draw a line between the, the role of the curator and the artist. And I really saw that in Michelle's work, because in, you're, you're curating content there, but you're an artist. And, you, and, it, and it is an artwork. I see it as an artwork. And I think that's, that for me, that's very interesting, how we kind of, those roles are very mobile. But yeah, in terms of the, the social issues, I think it, it's massive. And, you know, we're seeing it hitting in all sorts of ways about the minutiae of our everyday lives just being out there and then the issues about you know what happens to that both in terms of commercial exploitation of that intelligence being hoovered up and there's some really interesting interventions if you look at sort of you know personal data stores and you know things like mydex which give an individual control and so you can kind of take your data with you um, and the sort of economic things about people you know trading their data trails and you know controlling that at a local level but then, yeah, when we we can get very excited about the creative potential about all this stuff, but there's tons of big social issues in there as well. I, so I, I think sort of building off that, I think it's really valid. But, um, I have to ask this, uh, Steve. Um, you know, it's Google. We've seen two highly stimulating. Uh, you, you're a publicly, uh, you've got, a, you know, uh, people who make money from you. You make money. Um, you're building all these fantastic tools. Aren't you in it just for the money? Um, <laughs> um, so, lots of different ways to answer that question. Um, fundamentally, I don't think Google is in it generally for the money. Um, uh, uh, the organisation sort of is has got very lucky because it's hit on, um, you know, the uh, an, an incredible business model um, which throws out a lot of cash and that enables the business to do a lot of things but the organization itself is more driven by the idea of using technology to to quote you know, the mission statement which every every Google knows organize the world's information and make it universally useful and accessible and I think actually people who work for the organization genuinely think in that way and think about that um, for the Cultural Institute in particular, um, we're you know explicitly part of Google's not-for-profit corporate social responsibility work. So we will not be making any money out of the stuff that we do. That would be an anti-goal for us because as soon as we did anything like that, then nobody would work with us ever again. Um, uh, and so that's a reasonable guard against us doing that in, in that particular case. Um, there is a good question here, though, about um, how can how should a private company work with an idea of a public space? We're talking about this idea of the digital public space, um, and uh, this is an idea that's come out of the BBC, uh, a publicly funded organisation. Um, 
Uh, but actually, I think of it as a. I think the BBC has named something which was actually going on before, which is this whole move towards opening up data and publishing it under certain particular licenses, which clarify the rights around that data, the whole Creative Commons movement, movement the movement around linked open data. Um, and I think that we would like to see what we're doing as connected with that movement and with that organisation, with that moment, in the sense that we would like to give, we'd like to give. Um, partners who want to play in that in that space, the tools to allow them to do so under their control. We don't want to sort of say how a particular piece of content should be published or under what rights it should be published or who it should be published to, but we want to give people who have the content the tools to easily publish it in a way that makes sense to them, which could be under a Creative Commons license or it could be under a different license. Um, I... Uh, <coughs> Can I see if there are any questions in the house um, before I go? We have a gentleman at the front here. Is there someone with a microphone? If you just wait to get the microphone. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering um, if, with the idea of kind of an open kind of public cultural space, um, what then happens to um, the concept of an authorial voice or a curatorial voice? Because I saw in the demo of the, the Google cultural project where you kind of add content from multiple different sources you're sort of um, losing the attribution of where that content's come from. There's a lot of work and effort that's gone into sourcing that, creating a story for that individually. And I appreciate that it enables more creativity, but I just wonder what happens to um, the concept of historians and of cultural curators in a culture where all that data is mashable? Uh, so I think uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I didn't um, show the last panel that very quick exhibition that I put together and created, and cr created, which actually attributes all of the all, all of the sources of the data. Um, so uh, it, 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 attribution is something we think about quite a lot, and we want to make sure that somebody who's supplying the data gets attributed at the right place and in the right time. Um, it's also true that the partners who sign up for the platform, who, who or who want to participate. Um, get to choose whether to allow third parties to curate their material or not. There are some party, partners who are quite conservative, and they're like, okay, no, only me, or only me and these specific three people who I'm going to nominate. And there are other partners who are more open and who say, okay, I'm, 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 I'm interested in this idea of third party curation of my material, I'm going to open it up. Um, what we hope is that um, those who do open it up will see value out of it because we'll enable more authorial and historical voices. We'll enable, first of all, we'll enable exhibitions that would be difficult to do in the real world, and we'll, we'll enable curators, artists, historians, documentary makers, journalists who wouldn't necessarily be able to get that material, or it would be much harder for them to get that material to create um, objects from that material as well. And you know, more of that will happen. So that's, that's, that's the goal. But it's definitely experimental. It's, it's, it's not clear how, to what extent it will work. And, and maybe Michelle, thinking on a slightly different, in terms of attribution, I mean, is Carsten aware of his presence? Um, yeah, but, there, but as you saw, I actually I saw them. Yeah. So they, he, he's aware of that. And, and he did actually say, um, check back a week later and you'll see my birthday party video so but I, I, I work I, I sort of hover between those two kind of ways of working because I, I the work the work I'm doing tonight um, I, it, nobody knows that I'm working that I'm using their material um, and that um, I think it's sort of an intentional insertion of attention um, of of taking material out of context and, and weaving different narratives around that and sort of opening up that, well, what is a digital public domain? You know, what is this material that's out in the public? What can you do with it? What can, can you not do with it? Um, when I, when I uh, pu publish um, this work tonight online, I, I do sort of list the voices that are appearing within that, but they are not, themselves not aware. Um, Pleasant waking up tomorrow when they find out. Quite possible. Yeah. So, do you, do you want to sort of pull back to? Yeah, yeah. Just to answer that question very directly. I mean, I think that there's real deep 
insight and knowledge and expertise among curators, archivists, and um, well, number one, that is, is still vital. I think that there's a warning that needs to accompany this, that the, these capabilities shouldn't be an excuse to cut resource to that expertise and that you know, knowledge and capacity. Um, but at the same time, there is a deep shift in the way we do heritage, in the way we do heritage, and in the notion of what an expert is. I think if you look at the way Tony Aggie and Bill Thompson are working in terms of opening this up, and others, you know, like Europeana, it is about a, a big, a big shift. Um, and it's also about, as we'll talk tomorrow, about bringing these archives to life. Um, if you think of the huge wealth of. Uh, knowledge of uh, culture that's currently locked away and inaccessible, um, I think the gain in making that available uh, is, is really significant. Good. Thank you. Um, next question. I think we have a couple down at the front. <coughs> For you first. Please. Hello. Hi. Um, I was, um, I suppose it's an observation and a question. Um, considering that maybe archive material and galleries is potentially low-hanging fruit, and is there a way or any further examples that the panel can give um, that share theatre dance and those kind of shared cultural live experiences um, on the internet? Any kind of tips or indeed anything to signpost us to? Yeah, go, go. Yeah, I, th I think that's also a really good question. Um, uh, I think the question of how you... One of the things we think about a lot is what's the best representation of uh, a physical encounter with some with culture in the digital world. What what it can't be the same thing. Um, what's what's the best way to enhance the the, the real thing, the thing in the in the real world? Um, and I don't think we know, specifically for theatre and for performance. I don't think we know the answer. Um, uh, I don't think a video is it. Um, a video gives you something, but it's not. It's not um, it. I, I would want to see something that also was enabled you to spin off that performance and sort of ask other questions around it and engage around it um, and connect it to other performances as well. Um, we actually have a uh, ha uh, art talks hangout program that we do with the cultural institute with the with the art project um, where. Curators from participating museums have done hangouts specifically around, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, introductions to some work that's in the museum. We haven't, as far as I know, in the Cultural Institute at least, we haven't done anything which was using hangouts for a performance. Um, although I'll bet that somebody somewhere has, um, and uh, it, that's also a sort of an interesting thing to do as well. But it's also not quite the same thing as the as as being in the space. And I think that's very interesting. This tension between you know the real encounter with with the work, and and the fact that you're in a sort of digitally mediated version of that. Um, actually, that, of course, there are artists who play with exactly that, who play with exactly that tension, and that itself can create its own work. Um, but uh, certainly for theatre and performance, you know, we have some ideas, we've got some experiments, we've done some sort of interesting things, but I don't think we have any uh, answers there yet. I think there's probably other people who have, who've got who further down the line than we are in that. Okay, so we, should we move on to the next question? Uh, Including Olaf, actually. Yeah, I would like to react to this, actually. Actually, because Olaf is an expert on this. <coughs> there is a, a famous uh, choreographer in the Netherlands. His name is Jiri Kilian, and he developed um, a technique for recording the performances and use it for uh, reenacting these performances. Uh, he's calling it uh, making a visual, uh, what you do with music as well, you, you write the scores. Uh, so he made a visual representation of it uh, with certain camera angles and everything. Um, you should check into this. Yiri Kilian from the Netherlands Dance Theatre. Uh, <laughs> somebody will show you afterwards. I think there's you want to tweet it, maybe? Yeah, I'll tweet it. Okay. Uh, the lady, just the second row, please. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I was saying about, about sort of, sort of like, what people talk about with like authorship and stuff. Like, Michelle, when I was looking at your stuff, I kind of I found it really interesting that I was telling a story, but at the same time, you could look at it and you could that could have been a complete lie. You could have completely taken things out of context. And I think that is really interesting. Again, with the whole kind of like rewrite, remix, reculture, you can. Well, I, th I think it's actually really interesting to take something completely misconstrued. You know, you could have a sort of Google archive, which is just lies, and 
I, I think that's actually sort of a really interesting thing of looking at like how we take information. But I was wondering sort of with the creative commons and the kind of use of people's like their words and their ideas, like with the kind of notion that we've got about intellectual property right and copyright, like how does that affect your work and like is that like a sort of a barrier to sort of using the digital interface or is this something that's actually quite beneficial for it, like in general? Is it directed to me? Or I think in, like, just generally, like everyone, like creating this kind of like digital space, like do you find there's like legal restrictions on like what you can and can't use like with people's ideas and things? I'll, I'll answer a, a general one. So um, in a sense, one of the, the major underlying uh, uh, thrusts of the digital public space is precisely to clarify that question. So um, if you look at, for example, the BBC, um, there, you know, if you look at the kind of their content historically, you know, broadcast TV content, for example, it's incredibly complex. All the rights that are locked up around that, you know, if you think of all the music that's used in a in a you know a drama or whatever, every single piece of media has got its really complex rights associated with it. And actually, some of the the rights issues become easier if you're looking, for example, at performance, which has got another complex set of issues. So. Trying to, not, not all of this stuff is going to be free to use or to remix, but it's about making those rights clear and accessible. So, um, yeah, so they arise differently in different, different places. Um, I don't know, I guess I could just sort of talk about the history of appropriation in the arts is like long standing. So, I mean, there's a whole practice of working with found footage of filmmakers and so on. Um, Kind of working along that trend, whether it's, uh, I don't personally think about copyright or intellectual property. Uh, of course, it's sort of on the plate, but I actually just kind of move on and just do it. Have, have you have you done any work where you have um, where you've you've told a fabricated story based on real material? Um, but the, this is why I I mean I think history itself is always a fiction, even personal <laughs> personal history is a fiction. And that's why in the text I said you could be listening to an entanglement of fictions. You know, it's always it, there's always a possibility that I could just be making that shit up. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice question. Do we have any any more questions? Oh wow, yes we do. We have. Uh, let's let's aim right to the back. Um, you might have to stand and wave. It's always good for the panel to see who you are. Hello. Um, so I guess, you know, if I'm a cultural institute, given all your, given all my stuff to these kind of online spaces, what guarantees do we have that they're going to be around in five to ten years, and what happens if they just get killed and evaporate? Also, also a very good question. Yeah. Um, so I, I think um, the, well, d two ways to answer it. One is very specifically for the cultural institute, which is a bit of a boring answer to the question, is... It's, it's a long-term thing. Google's, made a, Google's making a long-term investment in this. But your question, is, your question is completely valid because, you know, Google could be bought by, you know, evil corporation, even more evil corporation tomorrow, and Never use the word evil. even more evil corporation could decide to shut down the Cultural Institute. So you're, 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 you're absolutely right. Um, I think uh, the defense against that is always, for us anyway, is always that, um, if you put your content in, you can always take your content out. Um, and in fact, in that sense, we're much more like YouTube um, uh, in that we're a sort of platform for publishing material, but the material always stays your material, and in fact, you can take it down at any point. That's also a little bit of a defense against the idea of what if somebody comes and misuses my material and does something with it, curates it in a way that I'm not happy with. Well, you can, you can take the material down if you're, if, you're not, if you're not happy with that. Because if, if you own it, you, you have control of it. So you can take it down and you can use it somewhere else. I think the answer to the general question about how can, you know, from a preservation point of view, how can we make sure that these digital objects have a long-term lifespan when the places where you put them typically have lifespans that are limited, that are measured in years, or, or at best, small numbers of decades. Um, that's a big unanswered question in the field. Um, my answer to it is you have to copy everything a lot. I think the only, in fact, I think this has always been the answer about preservation. The only strategy that really works in the long term for preservation, for preserving culture, is copying it as much as possible. Even, you know, I don't know what I, I tried. To, actually, it was one of my running things in the Cultural Institute. Is 
what's the world's longest, uh, what's the, the, what's the record for the longest continuously curated object in the world? Um, I think it's about 2,000 years. But that's not very long. That's only a couple of thousand years. And that's the world record. Um, uh, and that's, you know, in an, a monastery in the desert, which has been, you know, it's dedicated to that purpose. Um, uh, I think, yeah, other defences to, 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 to um, cultural preservation, copying is probably the best one. Make lots of copies and distribute them everywhere. It's like a fascinating question because I, I, I did a, I guess, a, do a documentary um, uh, in Helsinki where I was, I was interviewing. Uh, people and their archives, their personal archives, um, their documents, how they film themselves in the city. So I was looking at this relation, and the topic of like preservation kept on coming up. This is like, who are these archives for? You know, what value are there? And what's the future of these archives? And everybody was talking about them. Uh, I hope that I can look back at these 20 years from now and see myself. And I was thinking, the, so the, the, the time frame is like these long sort of like generations, <laughs> but I don't see these. I, I see, so what I'm doing is like performing like doing these excavations of the recent past. You're talking about like these time frames of like five years ago, ten years at most. And so there's still like this mindset that somehow it's their functioning as these traditional archives. And I'm, I'm just so fascinated about like these sort of ideas around like so I have where a, I, they are you know and i have a random live experiment how many of you had a blog or have a blog hands up this is this is interactive how many of you could find the first ever blog posting you wrote mm. really how many of you could find the first ever website you made no. right that's that's not that's not 20 years so I, I, I ask it because I'd struggled to remember the original URL. Um, I certainly didn't copy, copy, and copy again. I remember, I think it was quite good. Um, most of you will have, you know, the idea of the photo, the idea of that physical object that you could always hide away, put it in the suitcase. I think it's a fantastic question to ask. And I think the responsibility of the people who attend these things is to ponder on, is it continually making hard copies of your own materials. Your responsibility lies within the individual, not within a corporation. Certainly not a corporation that lives in the cloud, because quite rightly, you should be able to take it back. I, I think it, it could ponder a whole new, a different panel session about the nature of preservation and, and why. But it's certainly not five years. Um, it's certainly the idea of it at the point of leaving this earth. There's a man there, a gentleman, I, I hopefully have provoked an argument. Yes, it was, it was just a thought really in response to that, um, about how it's all very well to allow organisations or companies to kind of, well, to not put blame on them for losing our, uh, our own archives over time by us placing too much trust in them. But what about when those systems actually educate and develop us into ways of behaving that stop us from keeping paper copies of things, that stop us from capturing photography offline? particularly mm. services like Facebook, whose every intention seems to be to make it feel more seamless and easier to keep a personal archive totally within their, within their world. I, I think it's a very valid point. I'm, I'm not going to talk about Facebook in, in the, this context, but I think there is something that is also, it plays to our inherent laziness, quite frankly. You remember sending your film off, and then probably your generation don't, but putting your film in an envelope and sending it off and it come back, and they'd all not look quite as good. Well, we were lazy, and we're inherently a, a lazy part of society. You know. <coughs> anyway, that's a rant. So I'll leave it at that point. I see. I've got one one thing that I wanted to mention, which you just reminded me of, which is um, uh, an artist whose name is Adam Lowe, who uh, runs an organisation, a workshop um, just outside Madrid called Factum Arte, and he plays a lot with using digital technology to make physical objects. Um, and uh, one of his, one of my favourite experiments of his, I think he may be the first person who's done this, or maybe other people have done it anyway, but it's a, it's a wonderful project that he's done where he's taken a uh, black and white photo, it's actually a photo of his son, and he's, he, he thinks about how could this photo last 10,000 years? And uh, what he's done is he's taken uh, a slab of marble, marble is very long-lasting, and... He's used a laser etcher 
computer controlled laser etcher to etch the picture into the marble to etch it in such a as a depth map so that the the, the depth of each pixel represents the grayscale value at that point on the painting and so this this object that he's created of his son Otto he claims is a photograph of his son Otto which will still be in the world 10,000 years from now and I think that's he's doing other stuff that's that's in that same area and I think that sort of relationship between the, we think about we, we think a lot about how we take physical objects and make digital versions of them and uh, there are people, including Adam Lowe, who think a lot about how actually digital technology enables us to make new kinds of physical objects and make physical objects in new ways. And that's also a very interesting thing to think about. Any other questions? Uh, gentlemen, to the, and we're to, this will be the last one, I think, if the panel, if you want to come to the, the front at the end, catch other questions for the panel. Well, last I, question, I, I don't have a question, but I would just point out in uh, terms of um, remembering history that Natalie Bookchin and Alexei Shulgin did an online project where you could have your net um, work printed out in marble in the mid-90s, and I think Jochen Gertz, Gertz did as well. Okay, so it's not as new as I thought. But there is a business out there if you have got a really good 3D <laughs> printer and a marble, a slab of marble going. Okay, um, I very much like a big round of applause for our three uh, presentations.